Hi guys, this is Dave Metcalf from Cranfield University and welcome to this session, uh, writing a successful PhD proposal. Uh, you are in a, uh, a family group of potential PhD students to come here, so welcome, it's nice to talk to everybody. Uh, just a few, uh, a little bit of housekeeping, just make life uh, easier for everybody. We're expecting um, a lot of people to uh, hear. So what we've done is actually we've asked, um, we've set the system to allow us to mute you all. But that means if you want to interact, if you want to ask questions, then please feel free to question us, uh, send questions by the chat function. If you're not over familiar with WebEx, have a look at the buttons at the bottom of uh, WebEx, sorry, uh, Zoom, have a look at the buttons at the bottom. Okay, some of you is already sending messages. Uh, so, so we're fine. And he's saying hi. So that's uh, some people already found it. But if you there's a chat speech bubble down at the bottom of your screen. If you use that, you'll be able to chat and chat to everyone. Okay, chat to everyone. That means my team can pick up the questions. And that means your questions will get answered. Now, that is really for general questions. We're going to talk to you shortly about um, the structure of the uh, Cranfield PhD and what makes it unique and why Cranfield is, is the number one choice for PhDs in a number of subjects and uh, Professor Phil Hart will be uh, there to talk about that. We'll then go on to talk about okay what do you need to consider uh, when writing PhD uh, the PhD proposal to make your proposal stand out so that you get offered one of our limited uh, places. We will have a student to talk to as well okay to talk about her experience of the proposal writing process Okay, and that should be uh, quite enlightening. Uh, she's a very likable, uh, likable lady, so you'll have uh, fun with that. And then we'll be going into breakout rooms. Now, the breakout rooms are designed to allow you to meet five specialists from five different themes to talk about your um, specific uh, research. But what do you want to do? What type of thing you're looking for? Any ideas you've got? It's a Q&A discussion, what, make what you want of it, but you'll meet one of our, one of five academic uh, partners. Now, uh, we did originally ask people to actually let us know which, PhD, uh, which theme they were interested in going into. Now, a lot of people haven't actually done that. So we're, what we're gonna ask you to do before we start, if I share my screen, uh, I'm just going to take, uh, I wonder if I can take that off now. I'll just share my screen. Basically, what we need you to do to help me out, because I've actually got to build the um, breakout rooms as, as we go along. What we need you to do is in the participant list, it's the people button at the bottom of the screen, if you're not familiar with Zoom, find your name in the participant list, switch it on, find your name in the participant list, and roll your mouse over your name and select the more button. There'll be a more button selects uh, comes up to the right hand side of your name. What you need you to do then is to select rename and that allows you to type you, you you can change your name if you want but i wouldn't if i were you but what we would need you to do is type the number of the breakout group you wish to join in front of your name so david medcalf becomes one david medcalf and that would mean that i would know you want to go out into breakout room one so the list that there are five breakout rooms they're listed down here i will read them out just for just the you know, pleasure of hearing my own voice Autonomous Systems and Artificial Intelligence, Professor Gokan in Harlan, I think that's right, uh, so is breakout one, so put the, if you want to do that one, put the number one in front of your name. Computation, <laughs> Computational Engineering Sciences, I can't even say it, Professor Carl Jenkins, but two. Renewable Energy, Stroke Digitization, Stroke Net Zero is Professor Phil Hart, okay, but three. Smart Green Sustainable Manufacturing, or Smart or Green or Sustainable, I take it, is, prof, uh, is uh, Professor Costas Salonitis. Okay, Being that is, uh, we do a lot of work with these guys. It's nice, uh, they're all experts in their field. And people who are interested in the university's faculty development PhD program, that is actually, uh, they'll know who we're talking about. That is uh, Dr. Uh, Munia Karim. Okay, and you'll get Samina Masood from the um, uh, international rec um, student recruitment people as well there as well so please make your decision okay over the while Phil Hart is to Professor Phil Hart is talking next please uh, do uh, type in which number you want remember roll over your name in the participant list select rename and just type the number in front of your name so that actually I can get them to list much easier numerically and that will then allow me to put you in the right uh, breakout room 
if for any reason you end up at the breakout point and you're still in the main session, I will come and sort you out. We'll come and look after. We'll come and look after you. Okay, so that should be no problem. Um, if you have any queries or questions, uh, I don't know if that's uh, Salah uh, has got his hand up, but we're actually we're not going to uh, we're not going to answer that uh, um, one particularly. I'll ask Samina. Samina, can you actually talk to uh, anybody who's got their hand up if they've got problems? Yeah, on ch on chat, please. Yeah, I am doing that. Just that, just okay, so you know. Fine. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. If you want to go back on mute, and uh, we'll sort that out. So what we'll do then, without further delay, thank you. Sorry to keep you waiting, uh, Phil, but uh, we'll go back to you, and we'll take the spotlight off me so we can go to Phil. So I'd like to introduce Professor Phil Hart. Phil, over to you, sir. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Um, and welcome, everybody. That's uh, a good number, but David, just uh, just for a heads up, we've had a lot of people joining um, as you've been speaking, so uh, keep an eye on the admit button if you would. Okay, um, so my name is uh, my name is Professor Phil Hart. I run the energy and power theme at Cranfield, so essentially everything to do with the energy and power industry, from renewables to fossils to wherever. But uh, my mission today is to just talk to you about um, what a PhD is and why you should really choose Cranfield um, to do that. So um, let's, just, um, let's just have a look at, first of all, what is, what is Cranfield? Who are we? Uh, what are we all about? Um, well, we've got a really very clear mission. All right? what, we are, um, what we are all about is creating the leaders of the future, both within management and within engineering and technology. Uh, and that's been our mission for some time, and we are really quite successful at it. And our, uh, the way that we do that is we get the smartest people uh, who come and study with us, come and research with us. And um, our activities are all around unlocking your potential. Okay, so we'll give you the knowledge and the skills and the, the practice and the coaching to be able to become just as, as good as you can be. And we can do that because as an institution, we are, we don't do any undergraduate work. Okay, so there's no bachelor's level uh, work here at all. This is all around postgraduate. So if you come to Cranfield, you'll be surrounded by people doing master's degrees, master's by research, or PhDs. Okay, so essentially everyone who comes to us is already graduated from a previous institution. Um, we organize ourselves in, in about nine different themes, okay, um, in about four different schools. Um, over here, you can see we, we have a big uh, presence and a very well-known reputation in aircraft and aerospace and in transport, in manufacturing. Um, we have the school I work in, which is energy, water, and environment and agri-foods. Uh, we have a school that is about defence studies, and we have a very well-renowned uh, management school that's uh, one of the top ranked globally. So we organise ourselves within there, but we do a lot of activity that crosses over. So, for instance, I work with Costas on looking at how energy and manufacturing would go. I work with the management school to look at sustainability within energy and how it goes across to the way the business is run. So while we organize ourselves within these groups, we're very fluid and we're very sort of cross-cultural in terms of how we work together. Right. Um, to round off, we have about 5,000-ish students. It varies per year. Uh, so about 5,000 postgraduates and about 800 of those approximately are doing PhDs. Right. Um, and if you look at the makeup of our students in terms of demographics, about half of our students come from the UK and about half come globally, internationally. OK, uh, we are uh, we probably represent 75 percent of the world's countries at any one time. It's uh, it's great. You can walk walk around the campus and hear so many different languages and see so many different cultures um, in play. It, it's brilliant. Um, we um, if you we are very research intensive, 
right? And our research um, is used as, as part of the core of what we do, but it also informs our teaching. So all of our master's uh, courses and all of the taught elements of your PhD will be informed by the cutting edge research that we're doing at that time. Right? And we rank really quite highly overall in, in terms of our prowess. So if you look globally and look at the QS World Rankings for Engineering, we're up there in the top in the top 40 right, within mechanical, aeronautical and, and manufacturing. So we're a very research intensive place. We can do that because we're only looking at postgraduates. Our results put us in the top 40%. So Cranfield overall is a very highly respected a very capable school. If, um, if we look at a PhD, which is what all you guys are, are considering, I, um, it's worth just taking a minute to go, all right, what, what is a PhD? Well, right, um, and you can sort of define it as this is the top of the tree. Okay, once you've got this academic qualification, you can't really study for a degree that's higher. Right? And what that does is it puts you in about the top 1% in terms of qualifications globally. Right? If we have a look at this graph, that will give you a sort of a feel for where you would be academically across the world. That red line is 1%, and this is just a selection of countries. And you can see that if you got a PhD, you're in the top 1% of qualified people in most mm -hmm. countries. Right? Now, that means it's exclusive. That means it's a small club. And what goes hand in hand with that, with it being as high as you can get is, these aren't easy. Okay? This is a three plus year um, investment from you and from us in you to get you to the top of the three, to get you to that 1%. And there are some things that you have to achieve to get a PhD. First of all, you have to identify a gap in the knowledge pool of humanity, right? something that has not been discovered before, has not been um, researched in this particular way before. You are all about original work, trying to create new knowledge, new understanding, new methods, um, in a particular field and the field can be extremely wide but if you're to achieve a phd within the time frame allocated it's it really becomes quite specialized but to get your phd you have to do original work you have to and to do that takes stubbornness it takes really applying yourself over a long period of time. It takes listening to your coaches. It takes working with your supervisor. But fundamentally, this is your research. You will be supervised by an academic. If you come to Cranfield, you'll be supervised by one of the top academics in the world. But they are there to supervise you, to guide you, to give you the tools to do the research. But this is your work. And a lot of the work will be independently done by you, supported by the staff. You'll be expected to come in to plan your project and to work independently to deliver it, but have a team in the background of skilled people who can guide you along that journey. Make sure that you're going to get your PhD in the end. But do be clear, this is your PhD, your independent piece of research, and you will drive it with the support of the academic crew um, here. Um, every PhD is different. Right? They gen they, the registration period at Cranfield is, is three years, and you will work with your supervisor in your early stages of your project to plan out how you're going to get from day one at the start to three years in handing in your thesis for examination shortly after. But a typical approach might be something like you will spend the first about nine months or so um, doing a literature review, trying to understand what the current status of knowledge is for your particular topic. You'll move on from that to do uh, having understood exactly 
what uh, the state of knowledge is um, at the moment. You'll move on to go, okay, so here are the research gaps that I'm going to plug. These are the things that I want to discover. These are the things I want to invent. These are the methods I want to apply. Um, so you'll have developed your research plan while you're doing your literature review, and then you'll implement that over about the next sort of 12 to 18 months or so. And that is your discovery phase. That's when you are finding out the new knowledge. Once you've gathered all of that data up and done all of the experiments or all the field work or whatever that you might want, you'll then go into a stage of analysis where you try and figure out what does all that mean? And there's your key to getting your PhD. Right? Because during that analysis stage, you are pulling together all of the things that everyone's done before, all of the things that you've done yourself, and putting together the picture that says, so here's the answer. And at the three-year mark, you'll hand in a big written thesis that describes all of those things you've done and all of that new stuff that you've generated. Now, that is an intensive three years. And coming to the right institution um, so that you get the right support, the right coaching, and the right facilities to do your work and all that sort of stuff, that is an essential choice because this isn't easy, right? And that's where I think Cranfield really adds the sort of secret sauce, if you like, right? Um, you've got this big bit of work to do in three years. What you need to ensure is that you've got all the facilities on hand uh, to be able to do that work. Cranfield's facilities are pretty much world leading, right? We've got many, many labs but if we just take a look at um, take a look at some of these in detail, so you know we've got things like um, wind tunnels. Uh, we have things like a one megawatt solar plant that people interested in renewables uh, that generates power for the campus, but it also uh, is an experimental platform that we can use. Um, this is a thing called the PSC Lab. If you're interested in oil and gas technologies, this is where we investigate what goes on inside a pipe. Um, how do we how do we measure different types of flows and things like that? Um, you can go into the more advanced manufacturing and and aerospace schools, and you see here the the um, the guys working on solar panels with or essentially wrapping it around satellite dishes. Um, things like um, a digital air traffic control center um, for the air transport management people. Our labs are. And that's only a very, very small selection of them are, are pretty much second to none. It's something we're very proud of. And the, the key to them is like these aren't little cupboards that you're working in. These are big scale facilities. Uh, and one of the things that we let differentiate us from potentially um, some of the other institutions is um, these labs are big enough to run experiments that are relevant to industry. Uh, and the key is we develop stuff that industry uses very shortly after we finish. We're very much an applied place. So our facilities uh, allow you to do groundbreaking research. Obviously, the team that you're going to work with are incredibly knowledgeable. Um, and when it comes to writing your proposal or seeking um, advice off of an academic at Cranfield to, to, to go, what subject should we be working in? Um, that's the key, because we'll match you up with exactly the right person um, who can uh, supervise you within the domain that you want to work in. Um, we've also got an industry network uh, that keeps us relevant. Um, a lot of our PhDs, while they're groundbreaking in terms of science, um, we always come at it from a, a perspective of, okay, Let's develop the science so that we can apply it and do something with it and make an impact. Um, and our labs are supported by and used by big companies uh, like Airbus, uh, Twinings, Whirlpool, um, Heathrow Airport. Um, the, list, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, but in your time here, you can expect to be working very closely with the industry um, to make sure that your science uh, is going to make an impact later on, right? Um, but that's that's just you, right? That that allows you to do a really high quality PhD. There's also 
the fact that you're going to be with us for three years and that you might want to bring your family with you. Right? Um, it doesn't matter where you come from in the world, the chances are there's another person from your country on campus. We're truly international. That 50-50 split of UK and international um, students is really important to us. Um, but equally, our campus um, is a very, very safe and secure environment. Because if we look at it, let's have a quick look at what that looks like. This is an aerial view of the campus. You can see that um, up here is the airport. So if you're lucky enough to own an aircraft, you can fly in to, to see us. But we're a, a quite a rural campus, but we are five miles away from one of the big cities in the UK, a place called Milton Keynes, one of the big towns in the UK called Bedford. And we're about to the 35 or 40 minutes away from central London. So while the campus is, is very safe, um, you know, you're not in the middle of a city or anything like that, you're very well connected um, to wherever you want to go in the UK. So that, for me, that collection of the facilities, the skilled academics, the network that we've got into industry, plus the fact we're, we're an international campus, we work with every nationality there is, and it's safe and secure for you and for your family. Put all that mixed together, that's what makes Cranfield, that's what makes Cranfield special. Okay? But you don't need to believe me. What we can do is I can hand you over to one of our current PhD students and uh, we can let Sarah tell us all about her experience and how it's going. So um, Sarah, can you tell us what it's like from your side? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, uh, hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. And uh, my name is Sarah Bozman, and I'm a second year PhD student. And I have a scholarship from the Ministry of Education of Turkey. And according to the scholarship that I have, I will go back to Turkey and um, after completing my PhD, and I will be an academician um, in one of the universities in Turkey. Uh, so my background is chemistry and I did my master's on sustainable chemical engineering at Newcastle University. And I just need to highlight that we are not working in the lab like this. This photo was just taken for fun in a safe place. Um, so how did I choose this PhD project in Cranfield? Um, during my PhD application process, I sent emails to the supervisors of the projects that I found and I explained my scholarship and my background and I asked them if they want to see anything special for the research proposal. And I really recommend to do that. And, and Peter, my current supervisor was the first person who I sent the email and he responded uh, in, in, a, in a few minutes by saying he is very happy to work with me. And he, he said, let's have a Skype call and discuss about it. And then we discuss about the project ideas according to my scholarship and the PhD project, which I applied for. And we just combined them uh, together. And then I searched for the university and I will explain why Cranfield is the best after a few slides. Uh, so, Professor, uh, Professor Solitis will explain the key points of writing proposal in a minute, but I just would like to give you some suggestions according to my experience. Uh, just keep calm, you don't have to know everything. You will learn during your PhD, but just make sure you read the literature and you have a clear idea and just show them uh, your motivation, which is the most important thing, uh, I believe. Uh, so, what is my project? Um, yeah. the, according to the... According to the According to the literature that I read, uh, the idea of producing hydrogen from plastic was great for me as it uh, fights with the global warming and the plastic pollution at the same time. And then we decided to combine it with the artificial intelligence to model this process. So I believe I have a really cool project. And you can see my reactor, which I have almost completed the setup process, an image from uh, my MATLAB model. Uh, so. Uh, as Phil Hart uh, mentioned about uh, it, uh, Cranfield University has only postgraduate students, and you can't imagine how important is that. Uh, remember, remember, I said uh, Peter respond my mail in a few minutes, uh, so I have a quick response to all the emails that I sent to anyone in the campus, and you can get help easily when you need, and you can solve your problems easily. So it's fantastic. Um, also, uh, Cranfield University is known most with, with, uh, to the university, uh, industry, uh, 
so when you graduate, you will have the knowledge and skills to meet the, uh, the latest and real life challenges uh, facing both public and private sector organizations, and it helps you to extend your network as well. Uh, one of the biggest projects that we have uh, in Cranfield University is Hyper Project, which is funded by government. And this is my supervisor's project, and it's a 7.5 million word project. Um, uh, so it aims to construct a pilot plant at our university to produce hydrogen uh, in order to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. And also for me, as I have an experimental study, the most important advantages of the Cranfield is the world-class facilities that they have, which um, you can see some of them uh, here. And you can use these facilities whenever you need. You can find any equipment that you need, and you can do state-of-the-art science by using these facilities. Um, you can also find a budget to go to conferences in there, and I had a chance to go to a Women uh, in Engineering Society conference uh, which, uh, with the university funding. And to socialize, we have many clubs and societies which are related to sports, dance and academics. Um, and also, we also have a um, monthly seminar as an energy and power uh, department and which PhD students uh, present their projects and get feedback from our students and academics. And we also have, I mean, we had uh, before COVID-19 many social activities with funding of the department. And you can see uh, a memory from our social events uh, as an energy and power department. And also I had a chance to involve this funny project which university invited future engineers, uh, engineers to the big boat challenge. It was funny, it was fantastic to involve this kind of uh, events in Cranfield University. So after all of that, if you like to come to Cranfield but you're worried about your budget, I really recommend to check the website to see the funding sources. And if you have any questions, you can ask um, the student ambassadors uh, um, according to their area, country, their uh, department. Uh, you can just contact with them via the Cranfield website. And lastly, I would like to recommend to check the YouTube page of the university and you can start watching the videos that I record for the uh, This is Engineering Day and I will share the link of it uh, on chat after my presentation. And also recommend to the, um, watch the first episode of the Inside Bill's Brain document on Netflix. Uh, you will see our university in there as well. So thank you for listening. Good luck to all of you, Phil. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. That was, uh, that was really useful. Um, so Sarah works um, within the energy of power team. So um, obviously we're very proud of her. So well done, Sarah. That was, that was brilliant. Um, okay. So that tells you all about what Cranfield is and what's, uh, what makes us, I think, um, fairly unique. Um, let's hand over to Costas now to start to, to talk about if you want to come and study with us how you can put a proposal together um, that looks professional, hits all the right buttons, and might enable you to come along. So, um, Costas, over to you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I've got the responsibility of presenting the least interesting slides, I guess, of the day, but I'll try to do my best. So, first of all, a couple of words about myself, if I manage to change the slide, yeah. Uh, so I am a mechanical engineer by training. I have about 20 years of track record in research. So at some point of time in my life, I had to do a PhD, as all of you want to do. And I had to write a research proposal. And uh, unfortunately, at that point of time, I didn't have enough help. But I, I think by, by being at this webinar today, you will get this, this help. And over the last uh, 10 years or so, I have uh, successfully completed more than 15 recent students to completion. Now, uh, why does these things are important? I mean, the, the whole idea of this session now is to discuss about your research proposal and your research proposal is part of your application. Uh, it's the one piece of work that we will uh, use in order to identify a potential supervisor for you guys if you have not done that by yourself. And I will say a couple of things about this. And also I will tell you a couple of things about what the PhD is, although Phil has covered that quite uh, eloquently, uh, and also how you put together your research proposal, what should be included in a research proposal in order for you to be able to actually 
uh, get a place within our university. And as you might understand, uh, it's, it's, it's a very uh, big thing for you to actually get accepted from Canfield to, to be a PhD student. So although Phil has already covered what a PhD is, a PhD is about identifying something new. It's coming up with, with a new idea, with, a new, with new knowledge basically, contributing to the, new, to the, to the body of knowledge. Uh, and that needs to be done in a systematic way. And the systematic is really important as a keyword. So what we want you to do is identify uh, new areas, uh, identify gaps in knowledge, and then try to address these gaps through the research that you will undertake with the support of our uh, country supervisors. And personally, I do believe that the supervisors are not just supervisors, are more like mentors. They are helping you. They are there to, to support you. They are there to, to get to, to help you go through a problem. But at the same time, they are there to challenge you because it's far better to be challenged during the phase of your PhD, during running your PhD, rather than being challenged at the end at your viva. And a research can have a number of different uh, appearances. It can be pure and strategic. It can be down to a fundamental problem in material science, for example. Science. Or it can be something it can applied. Be something it can be uh, something that has to do with experiments. It, it might be something that has to do with uh, observing behaviors. It has so many different elements. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to solve a problem, but we have to be clear that not all problems are fit for research. So a company problem might be a good starting point for a research project, but it's not necessarily the bit that will get you to a PhD. Uh, so research in that sense is not just teaching, it's not just uh, scholarship, it's not putting together some knowledge to write an encyclopedia, a Wikipedia article. It's not just about data gathering. It's not just about the methodology that you are using. It's a combination of all these things. And as, as Phil said, it is a long-term project. It's something that will last for three years and it is a marathon. It requires your commitment. So before you embark in doing a PhD, maybe you need to, first of all, question your decision and ask, why do I want to have a PhD in the first place? What is actually that attracts me to do research? And on that basis, that should be your starting point. That should be uh, the identification of the topic of research. Think about which areas, for example, you found as the most interesting one uh, once uh, when you were actually studying as a, as a uh, undergraduate student, as an MSc student, but what were the bits, what were the, the things that were really interesting that you thought of actually investing more time, uh, digging deeper to find out answers to, to specific questions. And one critical bit in that exercise is to read. And you need to read, to read a lot. And you need to read a lot even before start reading. So even before starting your PhD, which of course will require you to do a lot of long hours of reading the literature, finding out what uh, everybody else has done before you, you have to do that reading even before deciding what is important. And through that reading, you will be able to open up your horizons, finding out different problems, but at the same time, start narrowing down to a problem that is important enough, that is worthwhile to focus for your PhD. And while you are doing that, you have to start keeping notes. Keeping notes is very important throughout your journey, uh, even from when you are starting your pre-PhD research, again, during your PhD and towards the end, because all these, these notes will serve you at the end in order to, to draw conclusions. And as we said, we have to, you have to cover some of the literature out there, especially during your preparation for starting a PhD, and identify a possible research gap. And you can always look for, uh, a, of, of, for inspiration in, in what the key players in this area are doing. So who are the key researchers? Which are the key research groups? in an area like carbon capture, for example, where uh, Phil Hart's group is actually doing a lot of work. Who are these key individuals? Who are the key groups in academia that are actually leading the research? Because if you identify this, then you can find out what are the next bits? What are the things that you need to do? 
and in your process of doing so you need to also look about what we've got available within Cranfield who are the most relevant academics in Cranfield and these academics as Sarah said would be more than happy to support you to help you so there are two ways of actually going about research either you come up with the idea and you put together your research proposal and then you let us decide whether we can support you with this research proposal and match you to the appropriate supervisor or you actually do that yourself and get in touch with potential supervisors and they will help you put together a proposal that would make sense and would uh, increase your chances of success. Uh, if you identify uh, an individual like that, if you identify an academic like that, then uh, you need to find out what is their most recent uh, publications. You can always look at their conclusions, for example, in their publications where they identify future work. And that future work might be the work that you will be doing as part of your PhD. So, as I said at the beginning, you start wide, you narrow down in order to get to a, a topic that is important enough to be treated as a, as a PhD uh, proposal. And of course, research is something dynamic. You might start with something which might evolve to, uh, to slightly different as you go about your research. And that's part of the research, basically. Uh, so, as I said before, just keep notes. Let's, let, let, let me give you an example of uh, what the process would look like. Uh, let's say that you're passionate about climate change and its impact. And of course, all of us should be passionate about that. It's really important. I've got Phil Hart here, who is one of the key uh, thought leaders in this area. So, uh, yeah, we, we should be interested about the climate change. So what is the first, the first thing to do? The first thing to do is Google. Well, that's, that's all the information is, is within reach of our, of our fingers. And you can Google things like, what is the current research in terms of climate change? Who is doing research? Uh, what is the latest research? Uh, how can we stop climate change? Which factors affect climate change? Just to put a few questions. And once you do that, you will realize that there are thousands and thousands of these results. And after probably spending a few hours, you will start identifying that there are many different perspectives into this problem. There is, for example, the perspective uh, from the energy theme where they are looking at stuff like carbon capture technologies. And I'm pretty sure that Phil later out in the breakout session will probably touch upon that as well. Or there are the things that we do within my theme, within my center, where we are looking at manufacturing processes, manufacturing systems, and uh, how uh, the, the, the operation of these systems might affect uh, the environment, what might be the carbon uh, footprint and so on. So pick the one that is really interesting to you. Pick the one that you are passionate about. Let's not forget that this is something that you will be doing for three years. So it needs to be something that you really, really like. I might even say love. And as you've done that, let's say that you pick the energy efficiency of manufacturing, which actually is an excellent choice. And uh, then what you need to do next is do a little bit more uh, focused research, uh, something like Google Scholar. Google Scholar will become one of your best friends once you start your research, because that's where you will be able to find papers. And within Google Scholar, even though you will not be students, you will still have access to a lot of papers that are open uh, access, which, are, which you can actually download and read. And if you, for example, search energy, energy efficiency of manufacturing, you will find out something like that, and you will see who are the key players, and the key players are the ones who have publications with many citations. And once you've got a good idea, then you can search within our Cranfield website, and you will find this guy who is uh, in this area. So having this as a starting point, then you can contact the respective academic. You can start the discussion with the academic, and they can help you write your research proposal. They can help you by, telling, by giving you hints, by telling you this is important in this area, this has been already covered. This has not been covered yet. There is an element that needs to be researched. You can do research in a topic that has been already uh, been researched, but with a different perspective, with a different approach. There are so many things that someone can do uh, when they do PhD. And if you're not sure who to contact, there's always Ms. Samina Masud who would be more than happy to support you in finding the right person uh, in order to, 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 to to work on your research proposal. 
So a research proposal in a nutshell is a document. It's a, it's a small uh, four or five pages long document uh, with your key research idea, which you will try to persuade the university to start with and then an academic that this idea is, is uh, worthwhile for you to actually go and study. So a research proposal in a way is a, is a concise and coherent summary of your proposed research. It sets out the central issues or the questions, the research questions that you intend to address in this three years long journey. It outlines the general areas of study within your research will, will lie. It refers to the current state of knowledge. It might have an element of literature review. It also demonstrates the initial thoughts with regards to the originality of the proposed research that you are willing to undertake. So what you should include in your research proposal, of course, a title, but again, this is a working title. This is a provisional title. It's something that you will be working in the, at least in the beginning of your PhD, for the first three to six months of your PhD, you will be working with your supervisor to make your title precise enough, to, to make your title sexy, if I may say so enough, so that can be then uh, used in order to, to, to explain your idea, to explain what your project is about. It's always good to have a, a good abstract, a, a, a comprehensive sort abstract of let's say 100 words, which uh, is basically a couple of sentences uh, where you uh, explain briefly what the problem is, what is exactly that you want to examine, what is the central question in your research. Uh, and then you start and you go into the actual body of your research proposal. The first key bit is the background, is the rationale of this research. What is the problem? What, where is the, the state of the art? as we speak, which are the key players, the things that you have already done a little bit of research before starting, you are collecting this information from your notes in order to write what the problem is, who are the key players, what is the state of the art, what is the literature review telling us about this, in order to help you identify your research gap. And a research gap is critical when you do your, your, your PhD. Phil did mention that in his presentation as well. What we are trying to address here is we try to bridge this research gap. And that will logically lead to what your provisional research questions might be. This might be in a, in, 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 in a, in a way as set as questions. It might be aims and objectives. It might be a research hypothesis. There are different ways of structuring that. And of course, if you've got uh, a potential supervisor, they will guide you. They will tell you their prefer preference, and they will help you structure that part of the research proposal in a way that makes sense. We do expect to see your initial thoughts about the methods to be used. Don't forget this is research, and that means that you have to be very uh, systematic and you have to have a very structured approach on, on how you actually go about your research. The idea is your results should be repeatable. If someone else was to do exactly the same research as you, they should get to the same outcome, to the same conclusions. So that is the part of your research proposal where we start looking at your understanding of what research is about. Do you want to do qualitative or quantitative analysis? Do you want to, to run surveys? Uh, do you want to observe people and to draw conclusions? Or do you want to run experiments in one of these nice setups that Phil saw us previously with these nice pictures from, uh, from his labs. That is the type of information that we expect to, to read at this part of your uh, research proposal. Uh, we might expect to see a time schedule, uh, a little bit of a Gantt chart. I think uh, the generic Gantt chart that Phil presented uh, previously is, is a very good example of what this should look like, but this should be a little bit more tailored a little bit more specific to your own specific project. And finally, your initial thoughts of what is the significance of the research? What would be the impact of that research? We are trying to change the world here. And this needs to be actually drawn out from your research proposal. Of course, at the end, your references. If the references that you have actually used during 
your write-up of your research proposal, but it also might be bibliography where you indicate key pieces of work that needs to be uh, started once you start your PhD. Uh, select an, uh, an area of research that you are really passionate about. It's something you will be doing for at least three years, and it's something probably that it will follow you for your rest for the rest of your life. No matter what you do, you will be a PhD in something, in energy, in manufacturing. So pick something that you would be very proud to carry under your name for the rest of your life. And through your research, try to change the world. So uh, if we're talking about climate change, find a way to fight this problem, find a way to stop climate change. If we're talking about materials, find the new exotic material that, is, uh, that has uh, zero carbon footprint and can help us do things uh, in a cost efficient uh, green way. You're not alone. Uh, academics at Cranfield will be more than happy to help you. Uh, while you are starting looking at, at areas of, of interest to you, find out who is the best uh, or the most appropriate person according to your understanding within Cranfield and get in touch with them. As, as, uh, as, Osman, uh, as uh, Serap said before, we are usually responding to our emails within minutes. Uh, a PhD is a long journey, uh, but at the end you get something very, very important. You've got uh, the, the accomplishment, the feeling of accomplishment. You've got actually proof that you can go about research afterwards in an independent way. And actually, by having a PhD, this means that you can actually supervise other PhD students afterwards if you follow the academic path. Uh, your research proposal will help us to establish that we have the expertise to support your proposed research and to assess your, public, your, your application. And let's not forget, the research proposal is just the starting point. That's all from me. I hope I made it on time. It's very difficult to get uh, uh, an academic to, to, to stick to the time frames. <laughs> I'll be more than happy to answer your, uh, any of your questions at the end or just link to me through uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, again, I'll be more than happy to, to, to help you. Uh, back to you. This is breakout group. That's brilliant, Costas. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So if I was to summarize all that, your research proposal to us has to show us you've read around your topic, you've understood your topic, You've started to identify where the knowledge gaps are and you've demonstrated to us that you are the type of person who really knows or wants to be interested in this topic for long term and wants to make a difference. And if you can get all of that into your research proposal, that will grab an academic's attention. Okay. All right, um, David, I think it's time for breakout rooms. So back to you. Okay, guys, thank you very much. So thank you to Phil for his general description of the PhD. If you've got any general uh, questions and queries, uh, then we will be answering those in the Q&A at the end of the session. There'll be about 20 minutes uh, available for that. We're just about to enter into breakout rooms for 20 minutes. Um, I've pre-allocated everybody who's told us which uh, theme uh, you're interested in. Okay, uh, I'll come and talk to those who are left behind because without knowing some, what you want to do, uh, we can't really help you. So, hi guys, thank you very much for, for that. There were a number of people who uh, didn't go into breakout rooms. They either had general, uh, they're, they're either not SWE candidates or had uh, other questions, but uh, this is the Q&A. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand back to Phil to uh, manage the uh, Q&A. Okay, so uh, uh, Phil, if you'd like to... Uh, start feeding the questions there are some general questions as well and i don't know if there's anything uh, if anybody's got anything specific that came up in their breakout rooms to the, my academics if you've got anything that came up specific in your breakout rooms which might apply to everybody then please do also do chip in but uh, phil over to you sir i just like to register the breakout rooms are really rude when they when they finish <laughs> okay time's up you're back to the big thing do get a warning. Right, um, Samina, um, any summary level questions? Let's, um, let uh, I have shared two with you uh, already in the chat directly to you because they, they, they seem to be quite good ones. 
Um, and then I will pick up a couple which came up in our chat room, so. That means I've got to find me in the chat. Hold on just a second. Uh, where am I? Okay, I'll really read it out. What yeah, should we right. take? Okay, sorry. What should be taken into account when the research questions are made? Okay, um, so uh, this is sort of one of the answers I gave in the breakout room. The, the research questions are trying to show us, or the research questions in your proposal, they're trying to show us that you've read around the subject and you've identified areas that are not settled or not researched. If you, I don't know, just take a, a silly example. Let's go, you read all around wind turbines and nobody's in the literature discussed um, the shape of the turbine blade. Well, that would be a really big research gap and you might write your proposal to describe what a wind turbine is, describe what wind turbine blade does and then go, the literature doesn't really address this point and this point and this point about blade design and I would like to address that. Okay, So those are the type of things that you're looking for. Obviously, it's not exhaustive. Right? But from your reading around the subject, you can't find information related to those topics. Therefore, that is a research gap. You can identify that on your proposal. Good job. That's exactly what we're looking for. If I may tip in here, Phil. Yeah, please. Uh, why, why don't you just look at the most recent publications and try to figure out at the end of their, uh, these publications what they identify as future research. Because these experienced researchers have done some work in this area that is of interest to you guys, and then they have highlighted specific bits which they did not really took into consideration. There might be some assumptions that they need to be further clarified. There might be some limitations in their work. These are the bits that would easily serve as the starting point for specifying your research questions or your research aim and objectives. Perfect. Thanks for that, Cossus. Okay, now, uh, Samina, there was a second general question. Yeah, um, the second general question is, what is the most important point to state while applying for a PhD? <laughs> wow. Well, I'll take a stab at that, and then I'm going to ask Costas to, to jump in as well. Um, what you're, I don't think there's a single point, but what you're trying to get across with your work is prove to us that you've read around the subject. Um, you've taken a little bit of time to read around and make sure that you are knowledgeable in the topic and that it interests you. We have to see that come out of the proposal because um, as Costa said and, uh, and as I said during the presentation, you're going to be doing this for three years. So we want to know that you're interested enough to invest a little bit of time up front. Then we want to know um, that you can pull all that information together that you've just read and make some conclusions out of it. Right? So that you've, you can assimilate information and not just go, Fred said this, Edna said that, Fred said this, Fred said that. Right? What we want to know is Fred and Edna said this, but Eric said something different. Right? There's, oh, that's, that's good because you start to go, all right, I'm collating those two. I've got a single point. People don't agree. And I've spotted that they don't agree. That's a key skill that we would love to see you demonstrate in a PhD, in a proposal anyway. Um, Costas, do you want to round us off? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess you did say everything. Uh, it's about critical discussion. It's not just about being descriptive about what you have seen in the literature, what you have seen on Google or wherever else, it's about being a little bit more critical. And as said uh, a number of times, it's an investment for you guys. It's a three years long journey. At the same time, on, on the other hand, it's an investment for a supervisor. So the supervisor will be spending quite a lot of time helping you, challenging you, uh, not exactly being your best friend, but they will be there to, to to support you in this journey. Uh, and they need to have some sort of confidence that their investment will have a return. And that return will be you graduating, you becoming 
better than what your supervisor is. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we fully expect that during the PhD, you'll, 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 you know, our knowledge will coincide and then you will know more about your particular area than we do by the end of it, because the PhD should be developing new knowledge, which wasn't there before. So by definition, we didn't, we don't know it. Yeah. You're discovering it, you're embedded within it, you're living and breathing it. So you should know more about it than anybody else. Um, I mean, if I, I mean, just say one, one thing, which I probably uh, forgot to mention when I was presenting, there is the element of the content, the technical content, this is what we expect to see, but there is also the element of the quality of the proposal. So it needs to be professional. It needs to look nice. It needs to be clear of spelling and grammar errors because that, that little piece of document, that this 2000 words document, these four pages, it's the only information that we actually have for you. So you need to make sure that uh, you are representing yourself with the best possible document. Have someone else, have a friend of yours, read your document before submitting it and discuss whether they understand what you are talking about. It's, it's really important because you are the ones who will be assessed with this piece of document. It's like a, it's like a small test. It's like a small examination. And I'm going to stop here. <laughs> um, Munya, did you, did you have your hand out? Were you thinking trying to contribute? <laughs> no, actually, uh, Phil, um, thank you for your vote for the great presentation you have. Uh, my, my, my question is, do you have guys any, any tips that you can share with students or with potential students about um, if they are motivated enough to go for the three years journey? So is there anything that they can do to know if they are motivated enough and if they can stand for the three years? Like for, because it's, I, I, I believe that it's one way journey, you know, there is no return, there is no return. So if you take it, it's for the three years and you are, you need to have to reach your objective, which is the graduation. So do you have any tips or anything to help the students think or just like make, make, make their minds about if they are motivated enough to go for it? Okay, uh, well, why don't I take a stab and then uh, I, I go out to the other, um, the other breakout room leaders, but um, it's it sort of builds on what Costa said. You can tell when somebody writes something, whether they're interested in it or whether they're just going through a process, right? It comes out of the paper as you read it because some writing, you can tell it's a bit of struggle, right? And some, you can tell um, the struggle was just, just crunching it down into a, into a small space. Right. Some some you can tell it's like pulling teeth. Others, it's like I'm so enthusiastic. I know the subject so well. And it's, it's and you can see that when you read it. Right? Your jobs when you're writing the research proposal is make sure that that comes out from your paper. Tell us, demonstrate to us that you're really, really interested in this, because a certain amount of sort of knowledge gaps and all that sort of stuff. Well, you're going to plug that. When you're doing your literature review right up at the start when you're doing when you're surveying what everyone else has done we don't expect you to know everything but you've got to demonstrate to us that you're enthusiastic enough about the subject that you're going to go off and plug those gaps right. um, can i open it up to some of the other breakout room leaders um, thoughts on that i'm going to let others speak I'm, I'm doing a lot of talking here so <laughs> oh look, okay any thoughts or did i did I do it? Looks like I answered it. <laughs> okay. Carl here. Carl, would you like to add to because you are on computer engineering, which sits across more or less all of our themes at the moment? Um, yeah, I can. I can happily add. Um, um, for for those in the breakout room, apologies for repeating this, but essentially what we do in computational engineering sciences, we we underpin all. The engineering if you have a complex engineering problem what we develop in terms of the software and the computational techniques enables that work to be undertaken um, in terms of answering the question for knowing whether you've got what it takes to do the three years of phd if you're a determined person and you can take a knockback 
and get up and carry on, then you've got the fundamental mentality set and motivation to do a PhD. During your PhD, um, it's very rare that everything goes well. There will be points where you'll have difficulties, you'll hit brick walls, doors will close, you'll go down a path that you can't get out of. It's how you get back from that. And if you've got that mentality that you will keep going, then you've got the motivation to do a PhD. I, I couldn't support that more. I think um, PhDs are 50% are you smart enough, 50% are you stubborn enough uh, to get through the whole journey and deal with the knockbacks like, like Carl said. Go on, yeah, you feel, yeah, yeah, exactly. I just got it. <laughs> okay. And uh, what I, my perspective is actually through the students, yes, I mean, we're talking to some degree about the end result. Is the, the process to go to the PhD and that, that's important, you know, that, I mean, not everybody needs to do PhD. And uh, mm -hmm. not that, I mean, once you choose that route, and I see it differently too. I mean, it's not that you cannot change your decision, but it's just, you're making an investment. And at the end of the day, you would like to get an outcome. And, you know, at some point, which you do not think that you, you are actually um, would enjoy the end results, then you might change your decision, but you would lose year or years. So, and within that, without even going down in here, uh, I always ask the applicants the first question is, what is the reason for doing PhD? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and not having one is also okay. I accept that as an answer, but I expect them to develop it. You know, it's just, it's just mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of the day, kind of like know that they don't have it, but in the meanwhile, kind of like understand of what they would prefer. So I, I would start from there, uh, from there, because you guys have answered all the all the other perspectives, right? <laughs> uh, all the other perspectives. So I, I I I I try to address like this to the students also. I'm trying to address points which is not actually addressed. So absolutely, that's perfect. Thanks, Scott. Okay. It's it's good. You've got to go into it eyes open, wanting it, yeah. and wanting I've it. Got... No, being really clear that you want it. Yeah. Well, I've got a very interesting question which I'm going to share is to get a PhD is it important to be lucky or smart <laughs> unusual question so I picked up <laughs> it's, okay um, luck is almost not part of it it's whether or not you can apply yourself to a topic stick with it apply your intellect to it gather all that information together be critical in your analysis of it and make discoveries luck you make your own luck by working hard yeah exactly and that's the that's the football term right you know uh, the big football teams bring their the hard-working teams actually bring their luck with them to the field that's so right. the same for the students and the best phds that i've seen is the people who are doing hard workers yeah. really going down great details yeah. and if you're smart if you're really smart then you can really make a very interesting contribution. Let me put it that way. Absolutely. Okay. So I think we've got very short time left and there is a lot of questions, uh, which is in my domain, so to speak, is the uh, how to apply and the process, the admission process. So um, to apply initially, I would request you, I've put my email and we will put it up again, get in touch with me bring your <clears throat> research proposal, your CV and all the information like, you know, certification, etc. Give it to me, email it to me, and then I will match you with the relevant um, supervisor, research supervisor. They may be the ones who were uh, leading the uh, breakout rooms or they would have set up somebody in their team who I would go and talk to. Once I have matched that, we will have an informal um, Zoom or Teams chat, but on a mutually agreed date and time. And then what we do is um, once that's done, because you may be thinking of uh, a, a very broad topic and these research, um, your post, uh, future research supervisor may distill and fine tune it. And then we put up uh, an online application. This is very smooth and easy. And once you've put the online application, you would be given a student reference number, which you then pass back to me. And we keep an eye on it uh, and make sure the, uh, to make the application process as smooth and as quick as possible. So in essence, any questions at the end of the session, please fire an email. 
and then there's no question which is a right wrong question so start with the question and then we will take it with where we go um so i hope that in answered uh, we still have a couple of minutes so i will leave uh, hand back to phil to give his final um words so so maybe i could just round it off because we've we've talked about this is hard work uh, yeah. we've talked about we want you to we want people who are going to apply themselves and be smart and stubborn and see their way through to the end or whatever. But let's just talk about the end for a second. Right? Because what you'll, what you'll do is you'll hand in your thesis and then you will have your Viva, right? And your Viva is a chance for you to demonstrate to um, a group of people who haven't been involved in your work, but are experts in the topic. A chance for you to demonstrate to them what you've done. Uh, a chance for you to start to disseminate the knowledge that you gained. And I always go back to what my supervisor said to me just before I walked in the door of my Viva. And he said, when you walk in this room, you know more about your specific topic than anybody else on the planet. So what have you got to be nervous about? Okay. Um, and I always thought, how many times in your life are you right at the top of the tree? Right. When you do your Viva, you are right at the top of your tree. Now, how long you stay there depends whether you carry on doing research and all of that sort of stuff. So you can, you can quite quickly sort of be overtaken by other people who are continuing your research. But for that time in your life, you're right up there. Right? You're more knowledgeable than potentially everybody else on the planet. And that feeling is um, that's worth it. Right, and that's where three years of really hard slog. And once you've got it, once you've passed your exams, and once you've graduated, you are a doctor for the rest of your life. Right? You don't have to do anything else. You, you have that PhD, you have doctor at the start of your name. And that, as I showed you before, is a very, very exclusive club. So this is hard work, it's hard graft, it, it will stretch you, it will keep you up at night occasionally. Um, but it is, in my opinion, anyway, and I'm sure the opinion of all the other academics here, it's worth it. OK, David, back to you. OK, uh, Phil, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank you all. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Serena for actually organising this with us and uh, putting the, the uh, show together for me. Uh, I'd like to thank the academic team, uh, Phil, Costas, Carl, Munia, and uh, Gokan for their uh, their input. I hope you uh, made good use of their uh, time. And also to Sarap for actually giving us the student's point of view. So thank you very much to her. Um, the, uh, Samina's email is actually in the chat to everyone. Uh, she is the main point of contact for all queries, as she said, and she'll farm them off to the right people. Um, so it just goes to me to say thank you very much to you all for attending. Uh, we hope you remain safe and that uh, wherever you are in the world and wherever you are in your day, uh, yeah, have, a good, uh, have a good day. And we hope, look forward to seeing you or hearing more from you, perhaps seeing you online shortly because there are other events for PhD uh, students. And if not, we hopefully will see you at Cranfield at some point. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, have a good day. Thank you to the team. And uh, that's it. Thank